Hi, it's Jim. I'm going to tell you today about a good idea I had uh, a while back. This is not the good idea, but it's also a fun idea, which is the Whitney Music Box. And I'm going to tell you about a technique I use to produce the music that was behind most of the Whitney Music Box variations. So if I start playing the Whitney Music Box, you can see what it is. It's a set of 48 concentric dots that are rotating around the center. The slowest dot, the largest one, does a full orbit in three minutes. The next dot goes around twice in three minutes, three times in three minutes, four times in three minutes, and so on until you get to the smallest dot, which is orbiting quite quickly. Because the dots are all orbiting at different speeds, you get this spiral effect. When the dots cross this line, they cause notes to sound. Now, the basic motion graphics idea for this came from John Whitney, who the Whitney Music Box is named after. John Whitney is a well-known computer animation pioneer. It's well worth uh, learning about him if you have not encountered his work. He wrote a book called Digital Harmony, which was about motion graphics uh, in 1980 and specifically about using musical ideas in motion graphics, um, which pervades much of his work. And in that book, he describes the system, I the visual system I just showed you, which is called incremental drift. And there is source code in this book. And uh, being 1980, it is basic, written for the Apple II. It was prepared by Paul Rother, an LA-based uh, programmer. And I ported this code to processing when I first encountered it, got a version that was white dots going around the center, and then I colorized the dots. And then I had the bright idea of setting it to music. And so I added this extra line. And when the dots cross the line, they cause a note to sound. And I made it so that each dot was tuned to a different note on the chromatic scale. And that produces the musical effect you hear in the Whitney Music Box. I made several variations, changing the number of dots, sometimes using harmonic tuning instead of chromatic tuning, uh, microtones, all different kinds of things. One of my favorites is the minute waltz, which I'll play. Um, it only lasts a minute, so it's good for showing sort of the whole sequence. The slowest dot takes a full minute. The fastest dot, since there's 60 dots, the fastest dot is one second. So... This goes through the whole sequence. You can see it making these, occasionally making these spoked starfish patterns. And when you see a spoked starfish pattern, you get a specific chord going by. This one will be whole tones. That's halfway through when you get the two spoke pattern. There's another three. The three plays a diminished chord that you just heard. And um, eventually, the dots all start coiling, 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 where, uh, as you near the end of the minute, here they go. And then you finally get a final big crash, and the whole thing starts all over again. Yeah! Very satisfying. So if you look through the different variations of the Whitney Music Box, it'll often say the music was generated with SID. I generated most of these using SID. And that's actually what this video is about. It's about a good idea I had with Sid. And that idea is bidirectional trees. So let's talk about Sid. Sid is software that I started working on back in the 90s to do computer music. And it is a node-based programming system where you drag nodes down from this bar of nodes and then you connect them together, kind of like a modular synthesizer, and eventually connect them to an output and they produce sound. There's uh, SID is available online. I don't recommend that you use it if you're into this kind of thing because it's not very good. <laughs> um, it has been in permanent beta now for uh, ever since I made it. And it's definitely not as nice as other node-based music programming systems like Max um, or VCV Rack, that kind of thing. But it does have one good idea, which I'm going to show you. So where's Sid? Here's, here's a live version of Sid. 
Um, so I'm going to take an oscillator and I'm going to patch it into the speaker. When I select the oscillator, I can edit its parameters. This one's going to have a frequency of 440, and I'm going to lower the amplitude so I don't kill myself. And, um, and now we should hear a lovely sine wave. Oh, yeah. So good. So now we could have multiple sine waves going into the sky. I'll make another one that's at 500. We can make some touch tones. And uh, let's do that. Oh, yeah. Ready to make some phone calls. Um, and then you can also, uh, you know, I could patch this oscillator into that oscillator and use it for amplitude modulation. I'll set this one to a very low frequency, like five. And then on this oscillator, I will multiply the amplitude by AM. That's going to actually be really weird, but let's see what it does. Yeah, okay, kind of works. And we get a little amplitude modulation. Um, if I do another one, we'll do it at three, patch it in and make it frequency modulation. We can multiply this one by frequency. That's going to be really weird because it's, let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's get a little more of that. Okay, cool. And then, um, you know, you can have more complex patches. Um, and eventually what you have looks like a tree with the roots on the right side and then a bunch of stuff coming in from the left. This node programming paradigm is quite common. Um, I've used a lot of different programs that use it. Currently, I've been doing a lot of video editing in DaVinci Resolve. That uses a node-based editor. It's also left to right, like this one. Um, Max MSP, Pure Data, Touch Designer, Reactor, all programs that use node-based editing. And generally, there's a lot of stuff. It's traveling either left to right or might be going top to bottom and eventually goes to a single root or maybe a double root if you're doing stereo, something like that. And it's a tree. Now, I had an interesting idea, and I was thinking about the way music compositions work. In a music composition, it's also like a tree. It goes, you have a single thing, which is the piece of music, like a symphony. And then the symphony is divided into um, three um, parts. <laughs> Hold on a sec. What are those things called? Movements. <laughs> the symphony is divided into three movements. And then maybe each movement has an A section and a B section, maybe recapitulates the A section or something like that. And then as you get from macro to micro, you can just kind of keep subdividing and subdividing until eventually you're talking about musical phrases and the notes in musical phrases and the frequencies in those notes. So Musical structure also is a tree, but we tend to think of it in a, uh, what we would call a top-down way, where we, where we go from the root, which is the whole thing, <laughs> down to the leaves, which is lots of different things. So it's, uh, it's an upside-down tree. And my good idea was that we could overlay the compositional tree onto the media pipeline tree. So audio signals would travel from, in SID, would travel from left to right, but compositional structure travels from right to left. So let's see how that works in SID. And the way it typically manifests, I'm just going to use a single oscillator here, is in something called the score module. And so if I patch this oscillator into the score module, I'm going to reprogram it so it's no longer using FM. And just to make it uh, more audible as individual events, I'm going to 
put a little envelope on this guy. Uh, we'll just do 1.01. So every single field in SID is a full-on mathematical expression, and there's a whole bunch of functions and stuff you can type. And uh, so this is basically going to give me, well, let's, let's just see what this sounds like without the score module first. Um, so I'll just patch it in straight in and make sure we get something out of it. There we go. Lovely. Now, if I patch it into the score module, what happens without doing anything special? Come on. So janky. We get a few of them. So what's going on? Well, the score module basically creates a series of events. You specify how many events here. So let's say I, I could say we want 12. And then I might say I want a random starting time. The duration of the piece is set by this guy. So let's say it's going to be a five second piece. And then I'll say random times five for the, dur for the start time. And I'll set a duration that's from half a second to a second. And then I'm going to use these two parameters to supply amplitudes and pitches, which are also random. And then if I use those parameters here, so I think it was P5 for pitch, and we'll use P4 for amplitude, we'll get, we should get a bunch of different notes. Let's see. Great. And so what's happening is when you're rendering the sound, the score module will create 10 instances of whatever's being, or however many, 12 instances of whatever's being patched into it. So it's as if I made 12 different oscillators and patched them in and had them all start at different times. And if I, I could change that to 50, and then we'd get 50 different things. And it's going to sound like crap. But there it is. <laughs> And the interesting thing is you can patch a score module into a score module. So, so, so notice that what's happening here is that the compositional information is traveling from right to left. We set up these parameters P0 through or P1 through P whatever, and they travel to the left and then they can be used by the things that are being patched into them as parameters. So I can have another score module here. Let's say we want to do like five tone clusters. So in this one, I'm going to say I want five of these things that have a random frequency. And then I'm going to, for each one of those events, of those five events that has a frequency assigned to it, I'm going to make 10 different oscillators that use P5, but then multiply it by uh a random value that kind of is a few semitones around it. And, and then I'll just pass the P4 straight through. Start time is now zero. Duration is P3, which is the entire event. And now we should get, uh, we should get five, yeah, five tone clusters. Cool. It's a, they're a little loud. Uh, so what I'll do is I'm going to do like 25 of these just for fun. And then I'm going to make the volume much a little quieter. It'll still probably be too loud, but let's see what we get. Yeah, it's going to be way too loud. <laughs> and it's clipping because it's so loud. Um, but you get the idea. I could also reduce the volume here. I could do that. Uh, maybe that might help. Let's see. Yeah, there it goes. So that's the basic idea. Compositional information travels from right to left. Audio information travels from left to right. It is a bi-directional tree. And so often in SID, I will create pieces that have very simple looking patches that are doing complex things. That's the good idea. So how did I do the Whitney music box? Well, if you recall, I have a set of dots 
each dot is going around the circle. at a different speed. And each dot is tuned to a chromatic note. So the way I would do that in SID is for the first thing I would say, okay, there's going to be 48 dots, 48 events, which each corresponds to a dot. Each one's going to start at time zero and is going to go for the duration of the piece. I'm going to go ahead and set the duration of the piece to 60 seconds, so I'll make a, a shortish one. The I'm going to make the amplitude. Uh, we'll just make it 0.1. See what see if what we get, and then I'm going to use the variable i, which is the event number. Um, over 12. So it's 2 to the power of 1 plus i uh, over 12, which basically gives us chromatic steps, starting from a pitch of 55, a frequency of 55. And um, those are our dots. And then for each individual dot, how many events are there going to be? Oh, I need to pass that in, actually. So I'm going to create a parameter P6, which is I plus 1. I starts at 0, so I want to start counting up from 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's P6. So for each dot, the number of events is P6. Um, it's going to start at um, I times P3 divided by P6, which is the total duration divided by the number of dots. Um, it's going to have a duration of about half of that, which is 0.5 times P3 divided by P6. Um, we'll pass P4 straight through. We will pass P5 straight through. And let's see if that does it. Yeah, that should do it. Let's see. And there it goes. Sid is also very slow. Okay, so, uh, and now we'll play it back. Sound familiar? Your basic Whitney music box. And to play this original one again, there we go. Has a few more bells and whistles on it, but it's the same basic idea. It's, only, it's going for a full three minutes. It sounds like I'm using a sawtooth, maybe. So that's the cool idea, bidirectional trees. If you're writing node-based editing software, consider using it. Bye.